Aisha, Aisha, Aisha Miles was here first. Thousand pine points. I don't know why my uh, event planned event streaming doesn't work, so I have to go straight to live now. Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, Camille's going to be here in just a second, but before he does, I want to play a. I want to introduce the twelve disciples, because. Um, I don't just take it for granted that these 12 disciples uh, actually existed in history. They could have, uh, don't get me wrong, they could have, but there's many reasons to think that um, a lot of these guys that you see before you, um, I'll put myself in the Judas square, uh, actually never existed. So I want to, um, when I was a Christian, it was really tough to keep all these disciples straight. And, um, and there's like, what, three sets of, of brothers in here, maybe even four? It's hard to say, and their names keep changing from one thing to another. So I'm going to introduce these guys one at a time as quickly as I can, and then I'm going to play um, some Christians, what they have to say about um, who these people are and how they died, and then we'll get um, Camille to give his thoughts on it. So Peter is also known as Simon Peter, not to be confused with Simon. He was also known by his Hebrew name Cephas. He was the son of Jonas, brother of Andrew. So there's our first set of brothers. Peter and, um, and Andrew were brothers, uh, probably fishermen, and unreliable. Well, tradition says that um, Peter was crucified head down in Rome. He was head down because he didn't want to be like, he was unworthy for, compared to Jesus, so he didn't want to have his head up. He wanted to be special, have head down. Next, we have James the Elder. He was the son of Zebedee and Salome, brother of John. So our second set of, uh, of brothers, James and John. What's interesting about James and John is that um, they're always mentioned together, and, um, and James' second name was Boanerges, Bo Boanerges, <laughs> which means thons, sons of thunder. And uh, I remember when I was a Christian hearing about that, and that kind of freaked me out a little bit of that, um, that James and John were almost like twin brothers, and they were sort of like Castor and Polydeuces, who were also sons of thunder, the Zeus, Zeus, the god of thunder. And uh, Poly, uh, Castor and Polydeuces were uh, often depicted sitting on the left and right of uh, deities. And guess what? James and John were asked, or, um, they asked Jesus if they could sit on the left and right of Jesus in his glory. James Elder was, according to unreliable tradition, beheaded by Herod in 44 uh, CE, according to Acts 12, 1 to 2. Actually, not according to tradition, according to Acts. Next, we have John. As I said, it's the brother of James. Um, and he, unreliable tradition says that he uh, miraculously survived being boiled in oil in Rome. And, uh, but he was the only guy who actually died of old age, according to tradition. Next, we have Matthew. He was a tax collector. He was also known as Levi. Uh, unreliable tradition has Matthew dying a, as a martyr in Ethiopia by a sword wound. Then we have Judas Iscariot. It was hard, really hard for me to find a picture of Judas because who in the world would name their <laughs> child Judas? So that's probably why I couldn't find a picture. He is the disciple who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He was a Judean, whereas the rest of the disciples were Galileans. Uh, he died by either buying a field and falling, causing his guts to fall out, as it says in Acts 1.18, or he died by hanging himself. It all depends what part of the Bible you read. Um, but of course, if you're an apologist, you can harmonize that. Simon the Zealot, unreliable tradition says that Simon, not to be confused with Simon Peter, was crucified. But we know almost nothing about Simon because he wasn't very popular, unlike the Simon you see in front of you. Next, we have Andrew, who I said before was the brother of Peter. He was uh, originally the disciple of John the Baptist. According to unreliable tradition, Andrew died by being flogged and crucified in Greece over a two-day period on an X-shaped cross. He wanted to be different than Jesus. He was unworthy, so he uh, wanted to be crucified on an X-shaped cross. You see a pattern here, how they wanted to die uh, not exactly in the same way as Jesus because they felt unworthy? It seems he suffered more than Jesus because he died over... Um, a two-day period, according to unreliable tradition. James the Younger, uh, he's the brother of Jude. So we have another set of brothers here, Jude and James the Younger, these two guys. Um, he is the author of the Epistle of James, according to some, that almost didn't make into it into the canon because James is very works-based. If you ever read the, the 
the book of James, it kind of is in nice tension with what Paul has to say. Uh, also, according to unreliable tradition, James died as a martyr and his body was sawed into pieces. Not a good way to go. Next, we have Philip, was probably a poor fisherman who became popular in the Gospel of John, just like um, Phil McGraw became popular on the show Oprah. He is often confused with the Philip in the book of Acts uh, 6, chapter 6, verse 5. Unreliable tradition has him dying by hanging, and he asked for his body to be wrapped in um, papyrus instead of linen because, of course, he wasn't worthy to be uh, buried like Jesus. Again, another pattern emerging here. Bartholomew, Mew, <laughs> or Bart for short, also known as Nathaniel. Some scholars believe he's the only disciple that came from royal blood or nobility. When the disciples went out to restaurants, Bart would always pick up the check. But I'm sure the other disciples would um, take care of the tip. Unreliable tradition says he died as a martyr by being flayed alive with knives or whips in India or present-day Turkey. We're not sure. Next we have Jude, who's also uh, called Thaddeus, also called Labius. Um, it, however, in Luke 6 and Acts 1, he's also called Judas instead of Jude, so he can be confused with Judas Iscariot, maybe, sometimes. Not to be confused with him, though, because um, he was Judas the Zealot, not to be confused with Simon the Zealot. Unreliable tradition has it that he died a martyr in Persia by arrows. Then we have Thomas. Thomas was uh, known as the Doubter. He, according to unreliable tradition, he was stabbed by a spear in India after being commissioned to build a palace for the king of India. And then these are the 12. But remember, um, Judas Iscariot died, and he was replaced by Matthias, who was stoned and beheaded. And, of course, we have Paul, who's not on here, but he's maybe like the 13th apostle. He was, uh, according to some sources, beheaded by Nero in 67 CE. So these are the... Um, the 12 disciples, and I, I made it pretty clear when I was saying how these guys died that uh, it's according to unreliable tradition. Now, some Christians out there might be thinking, no, that's, um, we, we, we have good reason to think these traditions are true and so forth. If you're that type of Christian who thinks that, let me play something for you here. I made a few clips of uh, Christian apologists, pastors, and so forth, uh, and some New Testament historians saying that these older traditions that came far after Jesus, let's say in the second, third, fourth, fifth centuries, sixth centuries even, um, they're unreliable and you shouldn't uh, trust them. So here's um, Sean speaking first. What's the evidence actually that is martyrs? And we don't have time to look at all 12, plus James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul. We're going to just briefly touch on four, and I'll tell you how you can track this down and study this to your heart's content if you want to know. But I'm going to show my cards for a minute. In all my research on this, hundreds of hours, I think of the 12 apostles, James and Paul, we have good historical confidence four of them died as martyrs and two are at least minimally more probable than not. So four out of, let's say, 14, Sean McDowell's saying here he's confident about. Remember, where do I get 14 from? Actually, it's probably 15. The 12 disciples plus Judas Iscariot's replacement, Matthias, that's 13, plus Paul's 14, plus James, the brother of John, not to be confused with James the Elder or James the Younger. There's so many Jameses. Um, uh, that's 15. If you want to see the way a legendary account of the empty tomb looks, look at the later apocryphal gospels which arose in the second half of the second century after Christ and later. And there you do have these sorts of features like the resurrection of Jesus itself being witnessed mm -hmm. by a crowd of hostile witnesses and the Roman guard and, and all the rest. When you so here we have uh, William Lane Craig admitting that you shouldn't really trust these later gospels uh, or traditions because, man, they say a lot of fantastical stuff uh, <laughs> that are way more fantastical, way more miraculous, per se, than, let's say, walking on water or, or uh, multiplying loaves and fishes. You begin to read the apocryphal works, you get, I think, the sense of the Spirit of God who shows you what the ring of truth is. These books don't have it. These books, the 27 that belong in the New Testament, do. 
Simon Peter said to them, to the rest of the apostles, let Mary leave us because women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, look, I shall lead her so that I will make her male in order that she also may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. You want that in your New Testament? Ladies, do you want that in your New Testament? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, this is a very uncomfortable thing, but what if it was true that in order for a woman to enter the kingdom of heaven, she has to become spiritually like a man, like a male? Um, you know, if it's the inspired word of God, then it's the inspired word of God. I think the way that uh, it says in the New Testament, the way women are saved is through, um, through childbirth, is it not? <laughs> is that any better? Um, Dan Wallace? So here's another example of why uh, Christians even say these later writings are not reliable because they're just crazy. Well, there's some problems with these apocryphal gospels. They were late, sometimes centuries later than the New Testament. But the key is that they were late. They were second century documents or later, even as late as the eighth century. Secondly, although they were popular with the masses, church leaders rightfully condemned them as silly and sometimes as heretical. You know, you get a sense that these books are loony, they're bizarre, they're, they embellish things. And when you read this literature, you go back and you read the New Testament, and you say, it's really subdued. When they even talk about the miracles of Jesus, they give you great details, but they don't have a lot, they, they don't have this embellishment that goes all over the map and says, uh, we have a Jesus. They don't have this embellishment, these later writings, uh, the Gospels don't have this embellishment, like these later writings, really? Like the temple being torn in two and dead people coming out of the graves. Well, we don't take that literally, right? It's hundreds of feet tall when he comes out of the, uh, uh, the grave, that kind of a thing. So just to sum up, sum up what Dan Wallace is saying is, um, look, you really shouldn't trust these writings because they're late. Now, this will be a theme. Um, if we don't trust what the reliability, the historicity of these things because they're late, then you shouldn't trust the martyrdom stories because they're late. And as Sean McDowell said, uh, maybe we can only trust four at best. Other question, is there any other writings on Jesus' life before his ministry, but after he hit like 12 or 13 years old? Are there any records of his life other than what's not in the Bible? You mean before he was like, like 12? when he was a teenager in his 20s, because you know he didn't become a minister until yeah. he was like 30. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, nothing that would be reliable. You've got the infancy gospel of Thomas that has some really weird stories about <laughs> Jesus. You know, um, one is uh, he was working with his dad as a carpenter, and his dad cut a plank too short, and he's like, oh, you know, I'm not going to make any money <laughs> off of this. and. Um, and Jesus said, no problem, Pop. And he goes over and he stretches the plank to the, the right thing. Third. Notice that he, the audience laughed there, that uh, the story of Jesus increasing the length of the plank, um, they just find that silly. But yet, what's the difference between increasing the length of a plank or increasing the amount of fish to feed to people? It's interesting what Christians view as... Uh, a sensible miracle versus a, just a crazy miracle. Okay, I want to play one more thing, and then Camille will come on. This is from GodQuestions.org. So again, I've been saying that all the martyrdom uh, stories for the 12 disciples that I introduced earlier, come from un, most of it comes from unreliable sources. And you shouldn't believe me. You should uh, maybe believe the other Christians who have the Spirit of God in them, and they're saying the exact same thing. The only apostle whose death the Bible records is James. King Herod had James put to death by the sword, likely a reference to beheading. The circumstances of the deaths of the other apostles are related through church tradition, so we should not put too much weight on any of the other accounts. Here's a Christian saying from God, representing GodQuestions.org, a place where I think a lot of Christians go to get answers to questions, saying, you know what, you shouldn't put a lot of stock and these martyrdom stories. And yet, so, I remember as a Christian, so many people, uh, my friends, when they got stuck, when I was asking them questions as a Christian and they just got stuck, they, they would always come back to this. But they died for this, Doug. Um, why would they die for this if it wasn't true? 
Okay, so let's bring uh, Camille in here. I'm uh, reminded of, um, hey, let's make sure your audio is working. Okay, say something, Camille. Testing, testing. You're Hi, good. can you hear me? You're good. Did oh, you, okay. Did you ever see the video that Palagia made on uh, martyrdom? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's pretty good. Uh, so I want to make sure that we don't repeat anything that he said. So after watching this, go and uh, watch his one. Yeah, so it's pretty short, I think. I'm gonna... Probably, it's probably going to be like 10 times shorter than this stream. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. We'll see. But uh, I want to repeat what Palagia said at least 60 seconds worth, because I think it's very important. And that is when we think about uh, eyewitnesses to something, uh, it, it's very reasonable to say, well, okay, if we have an eyewitness, it's some, we know who this person is, and he's claiming or she's claiming to have seen something with their own eyes, an eyewitness. And so for, for the apologetic of saying, you know what, we have martyrs, and they would never die for something they know is a lie. Well, Apologia's video is basically saying, we don't even know they saw the risen Jesus, risen Jesus number one. In fact, there's only one person in all the New Testament who claims to have seen who speaks in the first person, says, I saw the risen Jesus. And that's Paul. And even that's in a vision or by revelation. Maybe the Revelation chapter 1, you can say that, but ugh, uh, it's pretty clear that's a vision as well. And so Apologia's point was, look, um, show me an example. Show me the evidence of someone, number one, seeing with their own eyes, stating that they saw with their own eyes the risen Jesus. And then number two, was put in a position where they had to either recant or just stay strong in that belief of the resurrection and number three, that they died for their belief in the resurrection. And those are three very reasonable criteria. And you can't find anything to support all three to say, oh, maybe Peter. Well, we'll get into it. Maybe Peter's the closest. But OK, the floor is yours, Camille. Where do you want to start? You sent me a whole bunch of stuff to show here. <laughs> Yeah, so, so basically, um, first of all, let me say that this video uh, happened because of Captain Fartlicker, who in the last uh, video's live chat suggested this topic. So if you have an interesting topic you want us to talk about, feel free to, to suggest it and we can take a look at it. But this is something that I wanted to look into myself as well. So I spent like six days researching this and I went through like more than 80 ancient sources about martyrdom, like read them from for myself and put together a lot of stuff. Uh, but I basically noticed that there is something like a, a double standard when it comes to these ancient sources, because on one hand, as Doug said, um, Christians today are very critical about apocryphal books uh, to the New Testament because they are late and they are quote unquote crazy, like they um, contain a lot of miraculous legendary stuff. But on the other hand, uh, most, I would say almost all uh, accounts of martyrdom of the people that supposedly saw the resurrected Jesus uh, are e equally late, sometimes even later as the apocryphal books, and are also full of things that are very fantastical, right? So why the double standard? So this is uh, something that I want to look at. Uh, so you can uh, maybe uh, kind of get around that by saying that, yes, these martyrdom accounts are late, but maybe there is like a, a kernel of historical truth in them. But the, and all the miracles and all the fantastical stuff is like a legendary embellishment. But then I would have to charge you with anti-supernatural bias because why is something mundane, like a person being resurrected, uh, being crucified, more probable than some miracle taking place, right? Um, are you saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary oh, you evidence? Have a, you had a nice... Uh, Visualization, yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can bring that up. Uh, there it is. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so are miraculous claims in late sources improbable? So Christians can answer yes or no here, but if you answer yes... Um, that you kind of doubt the miraculous claims in late sources, then you go, okay, are non-miraculous claims in late sources also improbable? Now, if you say no, then you say, well, you're kind of saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If you say yes about are non-miraculous claims in late sources also improbable, then you have to reject the martyrdom claims that you hold dear, that all you know, these guys, they, they would never die for a lie, and they died. Well, you got to reject that if you think that... Um, 
non-miraculous claims in light sources are also improbable. If you say, are miraculous claims in light sources improbable? If you say no, then you have to put yourself in a position of accepting all these other miraculous claims in other religions uh, that are found in late sources. Yeah, and also you would have to uh, accept all the apocryphal late books, uh, Christian books, like Gnostic books, you know, heretical teachings that record um, other sayings and deeds of Jesus that are not in the New Testament that have Jesus reject the concept of the Trinity, for example, uh, that preach that the road to salvation is not faith but gnosis, uh, and these kind of things, right? And of course, you'll run into trouble with uh, other ancient religions because they also have um, writings that are removed from the actual events by a similar amount of time. For example, the life of Apollonius of Tyana it was written about 120 years after he died, which is comparable to both some of the apocryphal books of the New Testament, but also comparable to some of the martyrdom accounts. And so if you accept the martyrdom accounts and you don't think that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you should, in order to be consistent, also accept that, for example, Apollonius of Tyana was an incarnation of the god Proteus, because that's what the life of Apollonius of Tyana says. So I think, like, if you're a Christian and you think that extraordinary claims requiring extraordinary evidence is false, then you <laughs> you have no way to win, basically. Um, but that's a trap. We can, we can talk a little bit more about that. But I want to uh, just show what I've been working on for the last six days. So if I can bring up the, t the massive timeline that I put together, we can maybe talk about that. Not sure if you can fit it on the screen. Is that what you're talking about right here? Yeah, absolutely. So wh why don't you explain it? <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> okay. Just, just to make sure that, that you know what, what we are going to talk about. Uh, well, on the top here, you have uh, in bold all the disciples' names, and plus Paul and Matthias, maybe. Um, now, the, the green bars are from um, sources that are not apocryphal, and the red bars... No, actually... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go and, ahead. And the red bars are the apocryphal. And so here you have a list of all the apocryphal works, or not all, but a lot, um, and their dates. So it goes from 50 to 140. Uh, what's the latest stuff here? Yeah, 220. So early third century. And the longer the bar here, uh, the wider the range. Yeah, exactly. This is just uh, when these books are dated. And I'm assuming that when we're looking at all the individual disciples here, or apostles, um, that the green represents more reliable than, uh, that we can actually maybe say it's, it's more reliable than the, the stuff in red and, and gray? No, no, not necessarily. So the red stuff is just the apocryphal books. So red means that if you're a Christian, you should reject it because it's heretical. Uh, and so that's the that's what's below the timeline. And what's above the timeline are all the ancient sources for martyrdom. And I just color coded them green or gray. And green are only the accounts where it says at least where the uh, the apostle died and how, right? Because oh, okay, in okay. a lot of these other instances that are in gray, the text just says that the person was martyred and it doesn't really give you any accounts. Like in vast majority of these sources, there are no details at all. It's just like one paragraph or one sentence. It just says, Peter was martyred, but it doesn't tell you how, when, where, by whom, why, and it doesn't give you any details about like what the crime was, what the trial was like, what Peter said in his defense and stuff like that. So only, only the green stuff at least tells you where and how the person died. Okay, so if you're um, a Christian, if you're a Christian and you want to try to defend the martyrdom of, Jesus, uh, of the apostles, you should focus, in your opinion, you should at least 
focus on the green stuff because at least you have specifics, some specifics uh, of the martyrdom, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say that if you go to apologetic, apo apologetics websites, you will probably find a lot of other sources mentioned. But the problem is that they often don't even claim that the person was martyred. So, for example, um, what would be, uh, yeah, Irenaeus, for example, says that after Peter and Paul departed, such and so happened, right? And apologists will take the sentence and they will use it as a source. Uh, they will basically say that Irenaeus is a source for martyrdom of Peter, uh, Peter and Paul. But of course, Irenaeus never says that Peter and Paul were actually martyred. He just says that they died. But he, he doesn't even say that. He just says that they departed, right? Which presumably, presumably means that they uh, died. Uh, so I just took the sources where it's explicit that the person that the people in question were actually uh, martyred and not just uh, you know died. Okay, I think I left it up long enough. So if anybody wants to go back and freeze this the video, they can look up all those sources for themselves. Um, so if who would you say is the best uh, martyrdom story? <laughs> who has the most well uh, evidenced martyrdom? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can we can just qu very quickly go through the apostles because I've spent like almost a week working on this, so it would be a shame if it's up on the screen for like <laughs> one minute. Right? Okay, so which one? <laughs> what What do you want me to bring up? Let's Let's just start from the top. Okay. Um. So what were yeah. we were just looking? So at? I, yeah, first first thing which is really interesting is. So who exactly qualifies, right? Because presumably the apologetics goes that the, like the difference between apostles and other martyrs is that the apostles knew that like they saw the resurrected Jesus. So if they were lying, um, they were in the position to know whether Jesus was really resurrected or not. But at the same time, it also includes Paul who didn't see Jesus bit between the resurrection and the ascension, right? Like when Jesus appeared to Paul, it was after he ascended. So Paul technically is no in no different position than Christians today who also believe that Jesus appeared to them, right? Like there, you can find people just the Pentecostals who you can go that. to. You can, you, yeah, well, well, you you can you can even find uh, people who claim that Jesus appeared to them the same way he appeared to the apostles. Like they, for example, touched Jesus, right? So I was actually thinking. Even today, we could produce additional martyrs <laughs> like Paul just by taking these people and having them tortured. <laughs> because if they <laughs> if they fail to recant, that's like more evidence for Christianity, right? <laughs> but then the interesting question is, what if like only fifty percent of them recant and fifty percent don't? Does it mean that Jesus, like the probability that of the resurrection, is only fifty percent, right? So. Paul technically, I think, shouldn't be on the list because from the from within the story, there isn't really any difference between Paul and someone who claims to see Jesus uh, today. You know uh, um, that that point you just made about you know Christians becoming martyrs even today. I I'm reminded of uh, talking to what's his name Jonathan Pritchett 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 on uh, Braxton Hunter's uh, channel. And I asked him the question, uh, would you be willing to say, uh, I forsake the Holy Spirit? As an actor, as a paid actor, could you say that line, I, I forsake the Holy Spirit? And, um, and he said, yeah, because God knows my heart. He knows that I'm just a paid actor and I really don't mean it. What if, what if that's the case with some of these martyrs back then? Like, well, God knows my heart. I can say, yeah, I reject the resurrection, but God knows I really believe that I... I yeah. That, uh, that, that and that, that actually that actually happened uh, in antiquity as well because there were I think at least two instances when the Roman emperor decreed that everyone in the empire needs to publicly sacrifice to some pagan gods. This wasn't done to like undermine Christianity. It was done to as a, like as a manifestation of public support because in the ancient times your worship of the gods was very closely linked to your loyalty to the state because the state was ultimately like propped up by the gods, right? So there was this decree 
and obviously Christians were a bit in were in big trouble because it wasn't possible for them to sacrifice to the pagan gods. So we know from ancient records that a lot of Christians actually did that. So they technically leave Christianity because they didn't want to face persecution, and then they wanted to come back. <laughs> and as far as we as we can tell, their rationale uh, was that yeah, we sacrificed to the pagan gods, but we repented afterwards. So now we kind of want to be let in. And we have writings, for example, by Cyprian, where he's kind of wondering whether these people should be let into the church because they were apostates at some point, right? So we even have evidence of that happening in the ancient times. Yeah, if God knows your heart, then what's the big deal of recanting just for fun? Uh, because God has work for you to do on this earth. You know, you have to bring people into the fold, evangelize, and you can't do that if you're dead. So God knows your heart. What's one little lie, right, to save? <laughs> um, okay, so let's quickly go through. Uh, the, let's start with Peter because he was the first one on um, on my list when I made the introductions. Talk about uh, uh, Peter's martyrdom. Yeah, sure. So uh, just to correct what you said, the upside down crucifixion, that's actually a very popular myth. Uh, so the first source where the upside down crucifixion shows up is the Acts of Peter. And in it, he says that the reason why he wants to be crucified upside down is because people like when babies are born, they are born head first. So that's the reason he like that ne does never says that it's because he doesn't want to die the same way Jesus died. That's just like a popular myth. And I think that because, you know, martyrdom is not necessarily an extraordinary claim. And I th we have a lot of good evidence that mar like Christians were martyred and people being martyred is not like miraculous or anything like that. So I think for Peter, we have actually pretty good evidence. Uh, most importantly, it's because uh, the Gospel of John John 21, 18, I think if you want to bring up picture number four, it actually seems to allude to the martyrdom of Peter. Um, so presumably when the Gospel of John, which is usually dated to like 90 to 200, so it's uh, presumably the latest of the canonical Gospels, it has this line, it's right at the end. Uh, Jesus says, uh, very truly, I tell you when you, meaning Peter, uh, where younger, so on and so forth, and it ends up by saying someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. So this is taken usually as Jesus prophesying that Peter, Peter is going to be martyred. And the explanation is that the author of the Gospel of John, when he wrote the Gospel, already believed that Peter was martyred. Uh, and it that could have been true or he could have been mistaken. In either case, he put it into the gospel. And if you buy that this is a reference to martyrdom, I think this is pretty good evidence that Peter was m martyred, right? Like I have no problem taking that. Just like there are, for example, uh, Greek philosophers who were martyred. Socrates is, of course, the most famous examples, but there are actually others who like refused to recant some of their beliefs and they were tortured and executed. And in some cases, the evidence is actually pretty late. Uh, but just because it's like a, not an extraordinary claims, you, you need that strong evidence to support it, which is fine. But the problem is, of course, that it, this doesn't say anything about the circumstances. Uh, in some cases, the evidence is even worse than that. If you bring up uh, picture number two, um, that's, uh, again, another ancient text that's presented as evidence for Peter's martyrdom. But as you can see, it's even more like up in the air. This is from the Ascension of Isaiah, which is a, a second century Christian document, which is, it's basically a forgery. It claims to be a, a vision that was received by the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, but it was actually written in second century by a Christian author. And it talks about basically Satan, who is here called Beliar. And he said, he mentions the 12 apostles of the beloved, who is Jesus, of course. And it says, one of the 12 
uh, of the twelfth one will be delivered to his hand. And this is used as evidence of the martyrdom of Peter. The rationale is that one of the twelve could be Peter, and the second century author of the Ascension of Isaiah, therefore, must have known that Peter was actually martyred, right? So this is the kind of evidence that we are dealing with. Um, and the first really like solid description of why uh, and how Peter died is, are the acts of Peter, who are usually dated to the end of the second century. And they actually give you the details. So they actually tell you like what Peter did, why he was murdered and stuff like that. So you can read about it. But the problem is that it's obviously ahistorical. It's not even um, supposed to be a history, like a historical work. It's basically a, no a novel. A lot of these like acts of apostles that record their preaching and martyrdom are actually written in the genre of a novel. It's often a romance because it features a couple who, like a young man and a young woman, who instead of getting together in like a loving relationship, which is usually how ancient romances ended, uh, they convert to Christianity, they are baptized, and instead of having like a romantic relationship, they uh, devote themselves to chastity. So it's technically a romance, but it's like subverts the expectation of the reader about how a romance should end in order to promote Christian values like sexual uh, purity, chastity, and stuff like that. Uh, and of course, in the, in the Acts of Peter, for example, Peter publicly preaches in Rome. Uh, a lot of Romans are converted, including knights and senators, which is like absolutely impossible. The idea that in 60s, first century, there were senators who converted to Christianity in Rome is absolutely crazy. Uh, and it, what's interesting is that Peter isn't uh, arrested because of him preaching the uh, resurrected Jesus or something like that. What happens is that he converts wives of some powerful men to Christianity. And these wives then decide to leave their husbands and devote themselves to chastity. So they don't want to remain in the household of pagans and they don't want to have sex with them, which of course contradicts the teachings of Paul, who says that if there's a mixed couple, then they should stay married. But uh, Peter is arrested by one of these husbands who gets angry because his wife no longer wants to have sex with him. And he's crucified for godlessness. And this is actually a theme which is very common in these martyrdom accounts. So the uh, apostle is actually arrested, not because of what he what he preaches, because he usually in these acts he preaches publicly, there are massive crowds of people following him, nobody seems to have any problem with that. He's always arrested because he converts a wife of someone powerful, it's usually a proconsul who then doesn't want to have sex with the husband and the husband becomes angry and arranges the arrest and the martyrdom. This is right? the Pine Creek theory. And what's... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting thought. Because <laughs> the Pine Creek well, theorem, for people who don't pine... know, is, is my, my theory is, is that um, women have converted more men to Christianity than the Holy Spirit could ever do. And what... Camille is saying is, is the reason why a lot of these apostles were martyred is be not because they were preaching the resurrection or they wouldn't recant. It's because they got the, the wives of these important people to convert to Christianity and then they wouldn't sleep with their husbands. Yeah, uh, well, it, it's kind of the reverse, actually, of the theorem, because if the theorem was correct, then the husband would become Christian, right? But here, the husband is kind of like playing a role of the villain because he just like the the romantic couple kind of embodies the Christian virtues like sexual purity, chastity, and stuff like that, the husband, the jealous husband, is kind of an embodiment of the pagan vices. So he's in rage, he's very angry, he's uh, obsessed with sex and stuff like that. So that's why he, these apostles are martyred. And it's true that in these acts of apostles, the apostles are usually given the opportunity to escape. Uh, 
because usually there is a crowd of people who is kind of cheering them on and they offer to arrange their release or they are demanding their release but in uh, these uh, acts of apostles the apostles usually decide to like voluntarily go through the martyrdom and avoid being rescued uh so it's that 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 theme is definitely there like the martyrdom is voluntary nobody is forcing them to go go with that and they have the opportunity to get away but uh th these stories are just like they are not even supposed to be historical and they contradict what we know about how christians were actually persecuted so they the apostles are not asked to sacrifice to the altar of the emperor for example which is how that was one of the biggest problems pagans have with Christianity, right? Like Christians refused to worship the emperor as a god, which was like a, a symbol of loyalty to the Roman state. They are not questioned about the resurrection, teaching the resurrection. They are allowed to preach in public. Nobody obstructs them. And the reasons for their uh, arrest and martyrdom are um, completely different. Okay, so they weren't... So that's Peter. They weren't killed. Well, Peter at least wasn't killed. Uh, because of his belief in the resurrection is what you're saying. It's because of other reasons. Uh, in, yeah, in the earliest accounts, and as far as I remember, in none of the accounts that actually gives any details. Uh, and the same is true with the acts of Thomas, the acts of Andrew, the acts of Paul, the acts of Philip. Uh, and you, what you also notice is that they are very similar. Like these uh, act stories are very similar. They usually follow like the same pattern. Uh, there are like similar characters. Some of the scenes are the same, basically. Um, yeah. And what, what's important to realize is that like they are not supposed to be histories or biographies or anything else. They were intended to be ancient novels and we have other examples of ancient novels that are not christian martyrdom accounts right so we can like analyze them from the literary standpoint and we can assess their historical value on that basis so i i would say it's just like not reliable source of information about what actually happened to these people okay and then uh to sum up peter basically you have three greens here so base you have in the fourth, early fourth century, early fourth century to mid fourth century, and late second century, uh, you have three yep. three sources where it gets into the details of the martyrdom of Peter, and then that's it. Yes, and also like the these apocryphal acts, some of them are actually heretical. Uh, like if you analyze the Christian teachings that they espouse. It's not orthodoxy. So if you accept the martyrdom account, do you also accept, because like in some of the cases, the apostles are actually saying things which are heretical, right? Because the account, the acts were yeah. written by people who were not well, this part is, of the orthodoxy. This is what gets to what I played earlier on the clip of Dan Wallace and William Lane Craig and, and so forth, is, is that they don't, they realize this, and so they kind of, and Sean McDowell, they're kind of like they're backing off and saying, look, we got to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. It's, it's, we can't be sure that this actually happened because it was written late and it has all these weird fans, uh, fantastical claims and so forth. But now you're adding to, besides the fantastical, you're adding, you're saying that they're heretical. Yeah, I mean, so in preparation for this, I actually read uh, McDowell's book, Fate of the Apostles. It's very good uh, in terms of going through all these sources. Uh, in terms of like, what's he doing with them? I would say it's the second worst after Richard Bockham. <laughs> uh, but it's a good resource. And it's interesting that he doesn't want to accept what these uh, martyrdom accounts teach about Jesus about the nature of the Trinity and stuff like that, but he still wants to use them as like reliable historical accounts about what happened to the apostles. So, so he says, yeah, they are late, they are embellished with legendary stuff, but there is like a kernel of historical truth in them. So for example, when it says that, I think it's Andrew gave someone miraculous diarrhea, that's, later legendary embellishment but we can still trust the account because it says that andrew was martyred and when he does that when mcdowell does that 
He sounds exactly what? like Bart Ehrman. What did, hang on, hang on. What did Andrew say about diarrhea? Yeah, so th there is a scene where Christians are gathered in the house of a proconsul, who is like the main villain, and they are basically hiding there. It's like a, their secret con place of congregation, and the proconsul is like coming back home, right? So there's the situation where they need to escape very quickly, and either in order to buy, them buy themselves some time, Andrew just gives him diarrhea. So he's like miraculously spends a lot of time in the toilet and all the Christians get, can sneak out, out of the house. That's one of the uh, details in these accounts. That reminds me uh, of the, so, so yeah, so like- That reminds me, of, uh, that that reminds me of the movie, uh, A Thousand Ways to Die in the West. They had the, the dual scene and the guy gets diarrhea. But anyhow, um, yeah, okay. So are we done yeah, so, with- but my, yeah, right. but but my my point is that like Sean McDowell says exact sounds exactly like uh, Bart Ehrman, right? Because he wants to get rid, he wants to discard all the miracle stuff because it's late, legendary, and probably heretical, and he wants to like mine the golden nugget of historical truth, which is fine if you if he wants to do it, it's fine. But then he needs to commit himself to the claim that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and that mm, things that we don't see happening in nature today are like inherently less probable than normal, like ordinary stuff, like someone being crucified, for example. Yeah. And if he wants to do that, that's fine, but ne he needs to be consistent. Yeah, so basically we were saying um, if you're going to accept these martyrdom claims just because it helps build confidence in the believers of Christianity, you should s really start to accept uh, all these other claims found right next to it uh, and not uh, just cherry pick. Yeah, and miraculous claims in other religions. In because other religions. then in those cases, we also have sources that are just as late, like in the same range. Okay, let's, go, uh, let's move on to James and John because they're uh, next on my list. Uh, yeah, they are actually. Yeah, they are actually. So the sons of Zebedee, right? Yeah, right at the top here. Okay. Yeah, they are actually interesting because that's uh, another pair where the martyrdom is implied in the Gospels. So if you pull up number six, that's a quote from Mark. I think it's ten thirty-five to forty, where they basically come to Jesus and they ask him to be seated on next to his throne. And he basically says no, and he asks them, do, do you want to drink the cup, or are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And they say, yeah, we are able. So he says, okay, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And this is usually intended or understood as Jesus saying that, okay, the two of you are going to be martyred just as I am. Because every time the cup is uh, mentioned, it's basically like a, a metaphor for uh, martyrdom, right? Or suffering. Uh, it's either a cup or a crown. Like It's often said that the martyrs win a crown of martyrdom. Uh, so yes, yeah, in this case, we have uh, an attestation to their martyrdom in 70s, which is pretty early. But, but if you but this actually goes... accept the this goes against uh, yep. what a lot of Christians say that John was the one guy who died of, of old age because of natural causes, because they need him to live long. So he wrote, would have written the gospel of John later on. Yeah, I want to get to that, but j just let, let me yeah. make one point before. So if you accept that the cup means martyrdom, then you should also accept that Jesus prayed not to be crucified in the Gospel of Mark. I think it's in chapter 14. He says, Abba, Father, uh, for all things are possible, remove this cup from me, right? So if you think that cup means martyrdom, that that's really weird. Like, oh, yes. really? Jesus prayed to himself not to be crucified. He didn't want to go through the crucifixion. Right, like that's yeah, difficult. But Christians, at least a little bit. Christians have a good answer for that, or I shouldn't say good, but an answer for that. They just say, "Well, that's the human side of him." You know. Yeah, I think in some in some later gospels, this is even made like more explicit. Where right after that, Jesus says, 
the the soul is willing but the body is weak or something like that right so they want to make explicit that the reason why jesus d does that is because it's like his human nature but in the gospel of mark it actually says that he was like distressed right he was really like freaking out because he was he basically got scared which is an interesting thought like if you read the gospel of john that's not the same jesus basically it's Do you... it's a completely different character um, I, I spoke of this verse in my intro uh, when I introduced the 12 disciples at the very beginning. Do you believe that James and John actually existed in history because of this verse? Um, I mean, like, does this verse be, make you doubt that they existed? Yeah, I think I think a little bit because of the like the similarities with the Dioscuri, right, with uh, Castor and Pollux. Uh, but I have to say that I don't buy the premise that there that there is a mimesis of homer um but i have to say like i haven't done any detailed re like research myself into it i want to take uh, at some point at least a week to like um read through dennis mcdonald and uh, stuff like that like i only know about it basically i remember and i remember 15 years ago yeah. or so uh i was still a christian and i remember reading this it, I had skimmed over it when I was a kid, of course, and I'd read Gospels before, but I really, this really hit me like a ton of bricks, that James and John were known as basically the sons of thunder, just, just like the sons of Zeus, and thinking, my goodness, this does not sit well, that this is really sounding like a boring or a plagiarism from Greek uh, mythology, and um, that that caused me a lot of doubt, or some doubt, at least. Yeah, I mean... It's it's obviously like even if uh, it's true that the mimesis is there, that doesn't necessarily establish that the people are invented, right? Like it could be the yeah. case that they were really like two brothers, and it's just that the author of the gospel decided to depict them this way. But the problem is that if you take what we know about them and you remove all the stuff, then you basically have nothing left, right? You have just names. Yeah. So. Does it even make sense that these characters and the way how people think about them actually existed? Probably not, right? But you rightly pointed out that this actually, this implied martyrdom actually seems to contradict what we read about them later, well, specifically in the case of John, son of Zebedee, right? So Gospel of Mark seems to imply martyrdom. Then Papias, who is everyone fav everyone's favorite when it comes to uh, early attestation of gospel authorship says that both James and John were martyred in Jerusalem. But the problem is that then basically everyone else says that John died uh, peacefully in uh, Ephesus, uh, which is in Asia Minor, of natural death. And he apparently lived to be very long, ever uh, very old, uh, because he spent uh, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote, of course, the Revelation, and he was released during the reign of Tra Trajan, which means that he lived either Trajan or Nerva, I can't remember now, but he lived to to 90 CE basically, so he he would have to be very old. Um, so yeah. <laughs> That's, there are conflicting accounts. And in some later sources, for example, in John Chrysostom, in one place in his writing, he says that both James and John were martyred. But in other place, he says that only James was martyred and John died of natural death, right? And it uh, seems to be the case that there this uh, disagreement was motivated by theological reasons because there were some Christians who did not like the book of Revelation so they wanted to disconnect it from James, an apostle, and they wanted to say that it was actually written by someone else named James. And this is not the, you know, the son of Zebedee, one of the top three guys, basically, uh, that were with Jesus uh, all the time. Um, so that's actually interesting. So here we have conflicting accounts. According to some sources, they were martyred. He was martyred. According to others, he was uh, he died natural of natural death. Um, and when it comes to James, there uh, he's obviously beheaded in Jerusalem. He's one of the people who are martyred. He is beheaded by I think King Agrippa. Uh, 
but it again acts uh, don't give any details it's in acts 12 it just says about the time king herod laid violent hands upon the upon some who belonged to the church he had james brother of john killed with a sword uh, so no details we don't know like why he died um yeah whether Christians... he was asked to denied the resurrection and stuff like that. What, what do you say to Christians? Because uh, I talked to, I remember talking to Jonathan McClatchy about this a long time ago. And what he says, well, the whole idea of Christianity is based on the resurrection of Jesus. So when it doesn't say exactly why they died, it's a very reasonable assumption that they died for the resurrection of Jesus. Well, yeah, that's fine. But the problem is that you... In, we are talking about these people specifically, right? So if, the argument from martyrdom has a lot of moving parts that all need to be in place in order for that argument to work. Some of it was listed by Polo, in the Pologias video, right? So you need to show that the person had the opportunity to recant. Uh, you have to show that, for example, if they recanted, they would actually be released because in case of the prosecution by the Jews, these people would be condemned by the, based on the law of Moses. And of course, nowhere in the laws, law of Moses, it ever says that if you recant, you are not stoned, right? So for let's imagine that an apostle is uh, arrested by the Jews for preaching the resurrection. He recants later, he would still be stoned because the law of Moses doesn't say anything about recounting, right? It doesn't give you that out. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts. So yeah. you cannot argue that just because Christians were usually martyred in certain way, these specific people were also martyred a certain way, right? You need to argue about the specifics because it's you, the Christian, who are saying that these people in, are in some sp special position, different from just ordinary Christians, right? They are special because they were the ones who supposedly saw the resurrected Jesus, right? So it's not enough to say if they were martyred, they would be martyred like this way for this reason and stuff like that. Well, you just said, I think. You said something that I think will actually resonate with Christians a lot, and that is, uh, think about uh, an Old Testament person who uh, commits adultery and is about to be stoned, and they re they recant of their adultery, they repent of their adultery, they say, "Sorry, I will change my ways. I I really don't want to be an adulterer anymore." <laughs> it's like, okay, great, good for you, but we're still going to stone you, and the law of Moses would still apply yeah. to these Jews in um, in uh, the first second century. Yeah, and I mean, think of all the instances where heathens are killed in the Old Testament, right? Like there are entire nations who are slaughtered, basically entire cities, just because they were basically worshiping the wrong gods, or they were descendants of the wrong brothers and stuff like that in case of, in case of the Canaanites, right? So like the Jews never asked them, do you want to worship Yahweh? They just killed them because they were heathens, they are worshiping other gods. So yeah <laughs> okay so we talked okay. about we talked about peter james and john do you want to go to matthew uh or yeah we can go to matthew no problem okay. so what do we have for matthew it's not a lot uh, what's really funny actually is that uh there is one account which lists uh, apostles who died naturally it's uh, cited by Clement of Alexandria. It's a guy named Heraclon, who I think was agnostic as well. And he differentiates between Matthew and Levi. So he thinks that they were two different people, even though Christians usually believe they are the same person in order to harmonize the, the Gospels, right? Because I think in Matthew, the tax collector is called Matthew, but in Luke and Mark, he's called Levi. Uh, but according to this very early source, they were two different people. So again, you have to do some cherry picking. What's the name the of the source? Sources in order to. Uh, it's Heracleon. He was a. I this think he was here. agnostic. He was like, yeah, and he he uh, put together a list of uh, apostles who died of natural causes, and he he includes a couple of names uh, that, of course, are later contradicted by other martyrdom accounts. And he lists Matthew and Levi separately as two different people. 
Uh, so that's and why you, you have can... the dotted line in here. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And you can't even say that, like in the original Greek, they are meant. It's meant to be the same name, because there is actually, I think, Philip in between them. It says Matthew, Philip, and Levi, if I understand correctly, right? So uh, they are clearly yeah. meant to be two separate people. Yeah, this is uh, um, this is exactly why guys like Robert Price doubts that um, these a lot of these disciples even existed in history. Yeah, I mean, th there was a lot of confusion about the names, right? Like even in the martyrdom accounts, Matthias is confused with Matthew. James, son of Alphaeus, is confused either with James, brother of Jesus, or James, son of Zebedee. Simon the Zealot actually is confused confused with two different people as well. Either Simon, son of Clophas, who was the second bishop of Jerusalem, or with Simon, the brother of Jesus, who is mentioned in Mark 6. Philip, there are two different Philips, one in Gospels and one in Acts, and they are also confused, for example, by Eusebius. So, so there was a lot of people with the same name, and it was very difficult for Christians to keep straight who's who. Like even today, scholars are arguing how many Johns there were and who wrote what and what the details of their lives is. And of course, my favorite topic, I'm in the minor, in the extreme minority of scholars. Well, I'm not ex-scholars, but I um, am on the side of the extreme minority of scholars who think that Peter and Cephas mentioned in Galatians are actually two different people. So Peter and if you read the Pauline epistles, when uh, Paul mentions Peter, when he mentions Cephas, he's actually talking about two different people who were then conflated into one person that we know as Peter today. Almost nobody thinks that, but I think this is very probable. Okay, so we've done. So basically, there's nothing much on Matthew to say that he died as a martyr. We read Peter. We have some stuff, uh, some specifics, but it's again late. And um, why accept? Yeah. It? Uh, James and John. John. Uh, we have no. We have conflicting reports. Some sources say he was um, martyred. Some say he wasn't. James, the elder. Um, which is the brother of John, not the brother of Jesus. Uh, we have some specifics from later sources that he died a martyr. How about, um, well, Judas, he committed suicide. Um, but how, we're not sure. Simon, do we have anything on Simon? Not to be confused with Simon Peter. Simon the Zealot, right? Simon the Cainian. Yeah, so we, we don't have anything. So for uh, Simon, James, son of Alphaeus, Jude, slash Thaddeus, and Matthias, we don't have, as far as I know, anything from the first 300 years. And all of it, like all the later sources, they are usually contradictory, right? So for example, Simon the Zealot, according to one account, he died in Persia. According to another, he was martyred in Persia. According to the other account, he died of natural death in Jerusalem. Uh, according to Dorotheus, he was crucified and, sla crucified and slain. I don't know how you do that. I guess you like put him on a cross and then you cut his head off in Britain. So either in Persia, Jerusalem, or in Britain. Uh, James, son of Alphos, is either crucified in Persia, martyred in uh, Egypt somehow, or stoned in Jerusalem. Jude is either martyred in Persia, dies a natural death in Syria, or natural death in Asia Minor. So yeah, I mean, the, these like less known apostles, they are all over the place and the sources are always very late. And this kind of shows you, like there is a reason why we see this pattern. And it's because it was prestigious for Christian churches in various countries to claim apostolic authorship, like apostolic tradition, basically. It was advantageous for them to say, look, our community isn't just any random Christian community. It was actually founded by one of the apostles, right? So that's why you have the same apostles going all over the all over Europe, because everyone wanted to be able to say we were actually founded by one of the people who was sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? And if you claim this apostolic tradition, then it kind of makes sense to also have a martyrdom story, which places the apostles' death in the location where the church existed. And there are other reasons, for example, martyrdom sites as early as fourth century were actually uh, destinations of pilgrims and pilgrims bring in money 
so there was a monetary gain with like having like a burial site of some apostle. I think Thomas, uh, like a burial site of Thomas in Syria, is attested in the late fourth century, uh, specifically as a pilgrimage site, which of course contradicts a different account according to which Thomas was martyred in India. Uh, so yeah, I mean there are reasons why these discrepancies are there well well it's deeper than that there's reasons why they would lie <laughs> right? yeah can you think of some of the reasons well you just i what you just said it's um you can get a bigger following if uh you say oh thomas was our guy he actually was here um uh 50 years ago he start he uh was hired to build a, a, a in my intro, I, some Christians say that Thomas was hired to build a palace for a king or something like that. Have you ever? Yeah, heard? I think it's in the Acts of Thomas. Yeah. yeah. And so anyhow, yeah, it's, there's motivation to lie, just flat out lie and say these disciples were here because now we get people coming to our church. It's like, um, um, it's like Shaquille O'Neal. He starts a restaurant in Las Vegas. People will go to that restaurant just because Shaquille O'Neal started that restaurant, even though he's almost never, ever there. Um, they'll say, oh, hey, me and my buddies, we ate at Shaquille O'Neal's restaurant in Vegas the other day. Isn't that great? And it's the same thing. Hey, we're, we're, we're in a church that Thomas started, basically. Isn't that great? Yeah, and also you have to remember that like the history, early history of the church is full of politicking. Like people always imagine that this, you know, they were persecuted and everyone was kind of like band together and stuff like that. But if you actually read the church history, there was a lot of competition, rivalry about resources. So like different bishops disagreed with each other about important things. Uh, so it was advantage, like politically advantageous for them to be able to say, look, our church in Armenia was actually founded by one of the apostles, right? So we have this authority that you guys in Georgia, for example, don't have. Uh, so basically, on this list here, you said basically we have nothing for Simon, uh, Jude, Thomas. Do we have any? Uh, we have something for Andrew and Philip, though, right? Yeah, we have Acts of Andrew and Acts of Philip. If you if you want to bring up number nine, okay. that's really interesting for us to look at. There is no number nine. Uh, sorry, number eight. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so just to show what kinds of uh, like details we have for the arrest, trial, and execution of some of the apostles uh, in these later, later sources, I like created the synopsis of the trial and martyrdom of Philip from the Acts of Philip, so that you like people who are listening get the idea what kind of sources we are talking about, right? So Philip, as I mentioned, he's one of the guys who converts a wife of someone important who later is responsible for his death. In this case, it's proconsul. And she, as it's usual in this type of literature, she wants to devote herself to chastity. So the proconsul is obviously in rage and he arrests Philip and some other Christians, which includes a talking low part and a young goat that he met earlier in the lands of dragons. A talking so, uh, leopard. Earlier in the act. Yeah, talking leopard. Yeah. <laughs> there is a, uh, he, Philip goes to the lands of dragons and there is, there are two animals that talk and they basically become Christian and they are following him since then. So they are arrested. P uh, Philip is stripped naked and he's put on a cross. And one of, one of the female Christians is stripped naked. She starts glowing uh, like an ark full of glass, light and fire, and the executioners run away. Then John, out of the blue, he's not part of the narrative before, he arrives. And uh, they try to arrest him, the executioners, even though they have just run away, they try to arrest him. But their hands are miraculously par paralyzed. And at that point, Philip becomes angered, he's enraged, 
and he causes the earth to miraculously open up and swallow a crowd of 7,000 people who are there at the crucifixion site. But Jesus appears, he rebukes Philip for becoming angry and he punishes him. And Jesus basically says, look, uh, after you are martyred, you will have to wait for 40 days before a Archangel Michael lets you in uh, into the paradise. I wonder where he was and for those Jesus... 40 days. Like, is there a back alley well, he was outside in limbo. of heaven? <laughs> yeah, he was in limbo. Uh, no, not in limbo, in the purgatory, I think. Uh, the text doesn't say that, but this is usually how that's explained. Uh, he's just waiting outside the gate, basically. And then Jesus creates a cross filled with light. And the people who were previously swallowed up by the earth use it to climb back. And they want to release Philip because now they believe him. They believe in him. And but Philip uh, insists uh, on going through the martyrdom, and he dies. Right. And interestingly enough, inside that story, Jesus, when he appears, says that Bartholomew is going to go ahead and be martyred. I think in Laconia, uh, no, in Lycia which is one of the earliest accounts of martyrdom of Bartholomew. So that's, that's the, that these are the sources that we are dealing with, right? And you, if you want to, if you are a Christian, you are perfectly happy to say, okay, all of that stuff is late legendary development. What's really important, what's like the kernel of historical truth is the fact that Philip was martyred. You can say that, it's fine. But then you are basically saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and that it's more likely than a, that a Christian author would invent a miracle than that he would invent someone being martyred, right? Yeah. And then I would probably say that you have an anti-supernatural bias. Yeah. So all we are asking here is like, stay consistent. Yeah, the the Christian is uh, who <laughs> who uses martyrdom as an apologetic in the case of Philip, uh, for sure. Here is basically in a really bad shape. They either have to say, "No, we really can't say Philip was martyred," or they have to say, "Yeah, he was," but then uh, we got to reject the the swallowing of seven thousand people because of Philip's commandment or prayer to swallow those people up, or and that Jesus rebu rebuked him and all that. We have to reject that or accept it and. And uh, because we don't want to have to say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, we have to accept all of it. Yeah, they're just in real tough spot here. Yeah, but and if you, of, of course, if you accept it, if you accept the miracle stuff, uh, then to be consistent, you have to accept miracles in other religions because you have we have sources that are like comparatively late, like Apollonius of, for Apollonius of Tyana, for example. So you lose either way, I think. Th that's the trap that I've concocted for the Christian. <laughs> okay, yeah. so we talked about Peter, James, John, not much on Matthew, not much on Simon. Uh, we talked about Philip. Uh, we talked about Andrew. Did we talk? Yeah, we just talked about uh, Bartholomew. Nothing much for Jude or Thomas. Did we got all of them? Did we miss? Uh, we are missing Paul. Oh, yeah, you want to go uh, to the non um, disciples because Paul yeah we, we only have we only have two Matthias who becomes the replacement for Judas but for him we have nothing basically and then we have Paul and if you pull up number one that's really interesting yeah so, so basically for Paul again we have like the first clear account is the Acts of Paul and it's not much better than acts of philip like for example when they chop off paul's head milk for some reason just spills out of his neck and like sprays the the executioner uh, i always imagine if you saw kill bill like every time someone's head is chopped off, ch chop off from that in that movie it's basically the same except it's milk not blood and then um paul appears actually to emperor nero like there is an appearance of Paul to Nero, just like Jesus appears to people, Paul appears. And it's actually very common in these acts. After the martyrs are executed, there is like a, 
their appearance to someone after their their that died after their dead basically so that's the level the same um level of um sources that we are dealing with but this is something that everyone is tripping over when it comes to martyrdom accounts because it supposedly shows that peter and paul were martyred is the first clement it's the uh, the epistle of clement of rome it's actually a forgery but it's usually dated, I think, to like 80 to 130, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just quickly check that. Yeah, 80 to 140. And it's so if this is like factually correct, then it's a very early account of the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. But the problem is it doesn't actually say explicitly even that they were martyred. And I think in case of Paul, it's actually a very early evidence of natural death, probably in Spain. Because if you read it, the first paragraph is about Peter. It just says that he uh, went through many labors and went to his appointed place of glory, which can mean anything really, right? I didn't put it on the list because it's ambiguous. And I didn't want to trigger too many Christian apologists because they always bring this up as like the best evidence that we have for Peter and Paul. Uh, so in case of Peter, I think it doesn't explicitly say that he was martyred. It just means that he went to his appointed place of glory, which can just mean that he has like some super palace in heaven, even better than everyone else, because he was the best apostle. But for Paul, it says that he went to the extremity of the West and having bore witness before rulers, he departed at length out of the world and went to the holy place. So first of all, it doesn't say that Paul was martyred, which I think that if Paul was actually martyred, like if it was true that he was beheaded in Rome by Nero, and this guy knew about it, Clement of Rome knew about it, he would actually say so. So you can make like a, an argument from silence by saying that, you know, we have this very early source, which is the closest to the events. It would be like 20 years after the fact. And he doesn't say that his, he was martyred when he's talking about how he died. That's one point. And the second point is, it says that he, that he went to the extremity of the West, which means like the the most Western part of the known world, which at the time would be Spain. And he died there. And this is kind of consistent with the picture of Paul that we are seeing, where basically he starts by preaching in the Far East, given like how people thought about the world then, because he went to Arabia. He, he starts, he is converted, he starts uh, by preaching Jesus for three years in Arabia. Then he goes to Palestine, then he travels to Eastern Mediterranean, to uh, Asia Minor, to Greece. Then he comes to Rome, and it looks like he wanted to continue further to the West, because he wanted to kind of cover the entire known world with Christian churches. So this, according to this letter, he actually went to the extremity of the West, to Spain, and he died there, presumably through natural death. So this so this uh, is like the this yeah. is found where uh, this what we have in front of us. It's First Clement five First Clement. Clement five one to seven I think. Okay, I'm trying to think what the Christian would say to this. Okay, yeah, the Christian is going to say, yeah, <clears throat> Camille, it really sounds like he departed at length out of this world and went to the holy place. It, there's nothing about martyrdom here, but don't we have other sources that clearly state that Paul was martyred, persecuted, and killed for his beliefs? Well, sure, but that's just that would just be a contradiction, right? So yes. You have contradictory sources, so, which is awesome. Yeah. So the the problem is, what Camille is saying is, uh, yeah, Christians, if you want to choose this source over this one, you can, but you still have to say to yourself that this is here, and um, and and also a second point, which is extremely important, you have to remember that the probability of an account existing mentioning a natural death is not the same as the probability of an account mentioning martyrdom. Because there is all kinds of reasons why Christians would want to say that an apostle was murdered, 
But there isn't really that many reasons why they would want to say that he died of natural death. So if we have a source which says that an apostle died of natural death, I would place much more confidence in that, right? Because that's something that was actually against the best interest a lot of, of a lot of these Christian authors. So yeah, yeah I, I think like the natural death accounts probably trump trump the 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 martyrdom accounts just on intrinsic probability, right? That's you a, have to of course yeah. take other things into account. Yeah. That, that's a great point. It's like watching someone walk on water while eating a, a Snickers chocolate bar and someone just writing about the Snickers chocolate bar and not that they're walking on water. Um, you would expect uh, more accounts on martyrdom than just, oh, they just died of natural causes. Okay, I anything else you want to bring up here? Yeah, I just had, if you put together, if you put up uh, number three, this is really funny. Um yeah, it has, this has to do with James, uh, the brother of Jesus, because there were actually two competing uh, stories about how he died. One, of course, go, goes back to Josephus, who is a Jewish historian who writes about the events leading up to the Jewish war. And there is a very famous passage where he mentions the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, uh, and how he was basically stoned uh, for breaking the law by the high priest at the time. And this is what historians, both Christians and non-Christian, take to be one of the earliest extra-biblical mentions of Jesus. Of course, there are people who dispute it. They think that it uh, wasn't actually talking about the brother of Jesus, our Jesus. It was actually talking about Jesus, the son of Damnius, who is la mentioned later in the passage, and who is called Christ was just added there later by a Christian scribe. But in this version of accounts, this James, whoever that might be, is sentenced to stoning for breaking the law. But there was a separate set of stories, for example, by Clement of Alexandria, who says that James, was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple, from the highest point of the temple, and it didn't kill him. He was still alive. So he was actually clapped to death by a fueler, so by a crowd of people, and the fatal blow apparently was uh, struck by a fueler. But the problem is that these are two contradictory accounts. So what Jerome, who was writing in the fourth century, in the end of the fourth century did, he just harmonized the two accounts together. So he put them side by side by taking the two stories and basically just like smashing to them together. And I highlighted that by using colors. So the blue stuff comes from the Jewish war, sorry, from the Antiquities of the Jews, from Josephus. The uh, yellow stuff comes from this other tradition and the red stuff is what he himself added, which isn't in either tradition. And the green stuff is everything that the two accounts have uh, in common, which is only the fact that he died. <laughs> uh, so I just find this funny. <laughs> so Jerome was the first real apologist then? Um, in No, actually, if, you, if it comes down to harmonizing, you can find all sorts of examples that are much, much earlier than that. Oh, okay. This is just uh, one example that has to do with this specifically. Yeah, and what's what really pisses me off, and this is what other uh, early Christians did, for example, Origen or Eusebius, they claim that Josephus in his uh, Antiquities specifically says that the reason why Jerusalem was conquered by the Romans and why the temple was destroyed is because the Jews killed James, the just brother of Jesus, right? So these early Christian writers don't just believe this themselves. They claim that this is what Josephus says. But this is actually false, because we have the writings of Josephus. We know what Josephus says about the causes of the Jewish wars, and he never says anything like that. So there is a number, I, I think at least four, early Christian writers who misrepresent what Josephus says. And imagine, like, if we didn't have the writings of Josephus, if, you know, antiquities of Jews and the Jewish war happened to be lost, we would have no idea that this is what they are doing, right? They are just lying, basically, about what a book 
which we can read today, says. And imagine if they are doing this with Josephus, that which we can read. What all kinds of things they are also representing that we cannot check so state, because they are referencing sources which were lost. State very concisely what Josephus said, what caused the Jewish war, and what um, the Christians said later. Yeah, if you pull up uh, number five. You see what I did there? I segued for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so th this is actually from an article, scholarly article, uh, which is titled The Causes of the Jewish War According to Josephus, right? I, I didn't want to pull quotations from Josephus directly because there isn't like one place where Josephus explains what the causes of the war are. But if you actually read the Antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish War, uh, it's pretty clear that he's kind of painting the picture of the events that led up to open hostilities. It's like a very complicated story. There is a lot of uh, like animosity between the Romans and the Jews. There is a lot of mismanagement and corruption by the Roman elite. But what's important is that nowhere Josephus says or even implies that the reason why the war happened is the killing of James, the brother of Jesus. And if you put up number seven, this is what the later early Christian authors say about this. So we have first the quotation from Josephus. This is the only thing that he says about James, the brother of Jesus. And then we have Origen, Eusebius, and Jerome, who all specifically claim that Josephus said that the reason why the war happened was the killing of James. And Eusebius even like invents a quotation, a direct quotation from uh, Josephus, which doesn't exist, right? So he he's direct. It seems he's directly quoting Josephus, but that quotation is actually nowhere to be found in Josephus. And you can kind of even see why these Christian authors want to say that, if you if you read, for example, Origen, because they are. They, they are basically claiming that this is a hostile witness. They say, look, Josephus wasn't even a Christian. He was a Jew. But even he himself says that the reason why the Jewish war happened was the, the martyrdom of James. This, is, this was like a divine justice, right? Divine retribution by God for killing uh, Jesus' brother. But they are just misrepresenting Josephus. That, that's insane, right? Like these are the people that we are relying on for all kinds of things, not just martyrdom, but like the history of the, uh, of the, the church uh, in general. The authorship yeah. of uh, who, like, who wrote the, the Gospels, yeah. So we're, yeah. <laughs> some of the people who say uh, we can be confident in who wrote the Gospels are basically lying of what Josephus said. Is that fair? Exactly, yeah. The, the, you can't apologize for that. Like you can't come up with an explanation. I think uh, you would have to really like twist yourself into a pretzel, as uh, I think Bart Ehrman often says. So yeah, that's it. This is what I've been doing for the last week. Uh, I'm happy that I did that because I wanted to go through all of these sources myself uh, because you know I want to know the truth, uh, and it was uh, an interesting exercise. I got uh, to read a lot of. Um, you know, martyrdom accounts and stuff like that. It's funny, like if you, if it, 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 they, they, some of them are like really in, in, engaging novels. One of them is really like a horror because the martyr is said, the apostle is said to this city of cannibals that of course is fictional. We don't have any records of it existing. And there are really like descriptions of gory details of what the cannibals do to people and how they like eat their eyeballs and stuff like that. Uh, so. Some of it is fun. Some of the miracles are hilarious, of course, like miracles diarrhea. Uh, but you know, when it comes to historical reliability, I think uh, we I would stick with what we have for Socrates, for example, which is of course a martyr that has a very good historical attestation about him. Okay, I'm gonna sum up here, but before I do, uh, if anybody has questions on this topic, we're only gonna answer questions on this topic. Uh, Write them now. Tag me at Pine Creek uh, or at Camille. Camille, do you have your? Are you logged into the YouTube stream? Uh, no, just let just have them tag. Uh, just tag you. me. Okay, so watch for my name yeah. as well. But let me sum up here. Um, <laughs> Christians, 
stop it. <laughs> stop using the modern um, apologetic. And here's why you should stop. Because your own people tell you to. When I say your own people, I mean other Christians. And some of them you respect. Guys like Sean McDowell says stop it. He says maybe for four, maybe six at best. But stop it. Because these are not reliable texts. These sources, how, how we know it. Um, Dan Wallace says something similar. William Lane Craig says something similar, that these are coming from later traditions and legends that, that have fantastical claims. So if you do choose, pick and choose certain traditions and say, yes, I'm going to, I'm confident in my Christianity because of these martyrdom, these martyrs, then you have to admit that you're picking and choosing based on extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And now you're back to doubting the, the resurrection itself, because that's an extraordinary claim without extraordinary evidence. It's, well, they're not going to agree with that. But, um, and keep in mind that besides Paul, there's no one in the New Testament who identifies themselves and says they actually even saw Jesus. And, and we are not even sure if they had the opportunity to recant. And even if they did recant, as Camille said earlier, the law of Moses said they should still be put to death, at least by the Jews. So, is that a good summary? You want to add anything to that summary? Yeah, it looks like it's not really mere Christianity. Even if you throw out the Old Testament, you, it's not enough to just accept the resurrection. You have to accept all kinds of stuff, like martyrdom accounts, the authorship of the Gospels, in order to be reasonably convinced that Jesus was actually raised. It's mere Christianity plus. <laughs> Nick Jr. asks, would this give scholars inductive reason to distrust Christian sources specifically? Yes. Uh, or perhaps distrust Christian authors? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but yeah, uh, Christians even admit that these are unreliable sources. <laughs> Trevor Lynn says, the miracle of diarrhea. <laughs> Christ's followers were scattered throughout the lands from the miracle of diarrhea. Yeah, there's, that's, um, it says it. Where are you right now, Camille? In an undisclosed location? I'm at my parents' house. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm on the questions. run. Uh, I think we've upset a few people. Yeah, I, I think I should probably like disclaim that we are not denying the that martyred like that Christians were persecuted and martyred. That obviously happened. We have a lot of very good evidence for that, and it's obviously tragic. Like if if something that hap like that happened today, I would be the first person to defend a Christian against persecution. Right? Uh, we are just as good historians evaluating evidence for specific claims about specific people. Yeah, and when you say that you don't doubt that some Christians were martyred, um, you're not saying that therefore means that they saw the resurrected Jesus or that they had the opportunity to recant and all those things. Yeah, well, I mean, even if you, even if all the parts in the martyrdom, account, uh, martyrdom argument uh, are in place, it still is only a problem for a hypothesis that the apostles intentionally lied about the resurrection. But if they were honestly mistaken, if they believed that they saw a resurrected Jesus but actually didn't, which is something that I think happens all the time in all religions, then they would still be willing to die, especially if they believed that it's going to give them the first-class ticket to the paradise, right, or to heaven. Epic Christ asks, uh, who did Paul kill? Who did the Apostle Paul kill? Actually, does it even say that the Apostle Paul killed anyone? It says he persecuted the Christians. It doesn't actually say he killed any of them. Yeah, that, there is a hilarious story. Uh, what you, if you remember, one of the ways how James was killed was that he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. In some accounts, he's actually thrown from the top of the stairs, and that's how he dies. And in one account, he's thrown from the top of the stairs. He survives. But the person who uh, 
kind of ignites the incident is actually Paul. So in that version of the story, Paul already met James and he was responsible for almost killing him. It's it's like a superhero movie where in some adaptations, the parents of uh, Batman were actually killed by the Joker because you kind of want to put all these characters together, right? Or in Spider-Man 3, it turns out suddenly that the guy who is responsible for killing Uncle Ben is actually Sandman because he's supposed to be the villain in the story and you want to have these stakes, right? So, so you see why a, an author of fiction would invent something like that. And that's probably why we don't have it in other, other, any other account. Like, this makes much more sense if you your hypothesis is that these accounts are fictional. Yeah. Mountain Show 1 asks, uh, St. Thomas supposedly started the first church in India. Is there any proof of that? Sorry, I joined late. Is there any sources that say that he actually started the first church in India? Uh, that's a good question. I think the earliest source is Acts of Thomas, which is usually dated to 200 to 225. It's very interesting because in there, Thomas obviously is a twin brother of Jesus. He's actually identical twin. And Jesus sells him to slavery in order to get him to India. And the, the problem is that there is an account from the end of the fourth century, which says that the burial place of Thomas was in Edessa, Syria. So we have uh, two accounts which are not uh, like very, uh, very far away in terms of if you place it on the timeline. One of them puts him in India and the other one puts him in Syria. So you pick basically which version you like better. Okay. So what you're saying, there are some sources there, but they're not reliable, which is basically what the Christians are saying as well today. Yeah. Um, Trevor Lunn asks, were you surprised, Camille, when you did all this research um, that there was a lack of confirmation for the martyrdom claims used by apologists? Yeah, that's a great question. I was surprised by how fun it was to read through these sources because, like, if someone told me like, ten years ago that I will be reading through like early Christian literature, I would probably think he's crazy. But it's much funnier than you think. And in terms of what the like the level of confidence is, I was actually like hearing a lot of stuff from apologetic circles about what the sources are. And obviously, I was not impressed because the evidence is not there. And if you actually invest like a week really digging through that and going through the sources and reading the primary literature, yeah, I mean, if the evidence was really good, I would probably already know about it because the apologist would be shouting at that at my face, right? So not, not really. Uh, Odd Lang Sin asks or sa says, Carrier believes Peter, James, and Paul were probably arguing rabbis and highly educated. I guess the question is, do you agree? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So let's, uh, I'm going to trigger a lot of Christians. So just like cover your ears for a while. Yeah, I think that uh, the three pillars, James, John, and Cephas, who may or may not be identical to the people who are later depicted in the Gospels. It could be the case that they were just completely different people, not related to Jesus in any way, and none of the stories about them in the Gospels are historical. They were actually leaders of the church, of the Jerusalem church, at the same time as when Paul was writing Galatians, for example, and they were Torah observant meaning they preach that you can only be saved if you follow the law of Moses. This is, for example, why Peter rebukes Cephas in Antioch, because he shows that he's a hypocrite, basically, for only following the law sometimes. And uh, Peter is just some other guy who we all know almost nothing about, but he also preached the gospel of circumcision, meaning he also preached that you can only be saved by following the law. So yeah, Christians can uncover their ears. I think this is pretty similar to what Carrier thinks. Epichrist says, Paul himself said in his letters that he wanted to be in prison and suffer for Christ. There's no question there. Yeah, that's, ac that's actually true. And if you read what early Christians write about martyrdom, they never say it's a bad thing. They are actually happy about it. 
like for example, Tertullian says that, I think he says something like that, the blood of the martyrs is like a fuel that's filling the spread of Christianity. And they always say like, bring in more, like we want more persecution, more punishment, more uh, like flogging. And yeah, so th they were definitely, it was a death cult. They definitely wanted which, to, to suffer. Which totally, which totally destroys the martyrdom apologetic then. It's like, why would they die for a lie? Or, well, I guess it doesn't destroy that part of it, but it destroys the idea that, that they want to survive. They want to live. They, no, they want to die for Christ. And so they would say, bring the martyrdom on. Um, uh, yeah, I think the, the way how it destroys the apologetic is that, yeah, Paul was in prison many times. He was flogged, but he was never martyred. Like it, you know, like he... He's imagine that Paul is arrested. He's put in jail. Why is he not brought before a Roman judge, showed the image of the emperor, and asked to burn some incense to it? Right? Like actually, the earliest, if you are a Christian, the earliest and most detailed description of Paul being judged by King Herod and by a Roman. Uh, Roman governor is in Acts. And what do they say to each other? They say, we don't have any crime to charge Paul with, right? They let him go. And the only reason why Paul doesn't survive is because it's him who uh, appeals to the emperor. So even in Acts, everyone says, like, we don't have any problem with Paul. What are you talking about, right? He doesn't preach anything offensive. There isn't anything criminal about what he says. That completely destroys the apologetic because even Acts itself says that there wasn't any problem with preaching the resurrected Jesus, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. There was no problem with preaching the resurrection of Jesus because in Acts, in like, why Acts. is Paul not killed by? I think it's Festus, the Roman governor at the end of Acts. Yeah, he basically lets him go uh, because there isn't any problem. Uh, Nick Jr. asks, can it be established if early Christians were more willing to lie for their doctrine than pagans at the time? I would say very provisionally, yeah, maybe yes. And it's because one thing that's very different about Christianity, if you compare it to other religions, like uh, pagan religions, is that Christianity was specifically based on what you believe. There was a requirement for a belief. You had to have specific beliefs. If you look at other religions, pagan religions, it was much more often about following the rituals exactly, right? That was the, the important thing. You can you can even uh, see that, for example, in Judaism, like if you read through, read through the Torah, it has a, a lot of uh, descriptions of sacrifices that are supposed to be followed exactly, like which side of the altar you are supposed to sprinkle the blood and stuff like that. But it doesn't really go into that much detail about what you should believe and should not believe about the nature of God, for example. And we have writings in from Romans, for example, in Cicero, where there are several people in conversation that believe completely different things about the gods, including gods don't exist at all that have not, no problem talking to each other. You know, they have, are friends, they are, are dialoguing and stuff like that. Uh, they obviously all follow all the procedures, like they sacrifice to the gods, they have go to the temples and stuff like that, because that was the religion, that, that was what the religion was about. But it, in Christianity, it was specifically about the belief. And because it was about the belief, it was very important for these early Christian authors to establish like strong, reliable, apostolic traditions backing up these beliefs. We see, obviously, the Orthodox Fathers doing that as well. But we also see, for example, Gnostics trying to establish their own apostolic authority, going back to the apostles of Jesus, right? Uh, so yeah, I would say just by this uh, feature of Christianity, it, there could have been higher incentive for these people to lie about historical events because they had very good reason that the pagans didn't have. James Linden asks, is there any evidence for the stoning of Stephen? Yeah, did we talk about Stephen? I don't think we did, did we? 
Yeah, it's in Acts. We didn't t- talk about it because Stephen is not considered one of the people who saw the risen Jesus between the resurrection and the ascension. He, of course, in Acts, sees a vision of Jesus right before he dies. So if you believe that, then there you go. That's, so- that's actually pretty good because Acts are relatively early. They are much earlier than all the other sources that we were talking about usually. So how would you answer this true or false question? True or false, there's evidence for martyrdom in the New Testament. Um, yes, obviously, like true. And which ones? Out of all the... You t- mean a martyrdom, of, martyrdom of specific people? Oh, sorry, disciples, yeah. Of, of the 12 disciples and Paul, and Matthias, because he replaced Judas, out of those 14... How many of those 14 would you say there's evidence of martyrdom within the New Testament? Uh, I would say Peter. That's fine. Like, I have no problem saying that Peter was martyred. Uh, That he died specifically because he was a Christian, just because the Gospel of John. Uh, I would say James because of Acts. Uh, even though like my level of confidence is much lower because there's all kinds of problems with Acts uh, as, like in terms of historical reliability, when it should be dated and stuff like that. And that's probably it because the Jesus saying that the sons of Zebedee are going to be martyred, that doesn't have to necessarily be the New Testament basically commenting on these two people specifically being killed. It could just be a fictional story about martyrdom in general, which is just tied to these two people for literary purposes, right? So it doesn't even have to be the author of the Gospel of Mark knew that these two people specifically were martyred. That's why he put the story in. It could just be a fictional story where Jesus is commenting about martyrdom. He says, look, you are going to be persecuted, expect persecution, because that's obviously what was happening to Christians when the Gospel of Mark was being written, right? Uh, then you have Stephen, but the prob- problem with the crucifixion, with the um, uh, martyrdom of Stephen is that it seems to be based on, uh, and in general, the books of Acts seems to be based on the Old Testament books, specifically on Second Maccabees, uh, which has really powerful martyrdom stories from uh of jews from the maccabean revolt for example the story of eleazar or the mother with the seven sons and stuff like that so it seems that these martyrdom stories are actually modeled after pre-existing stories of martyrdom from judaism from the second second century bc okay that's interesting so basically at best out of uh the 14 or 15 candidates um who walked and talked with Jesus. Well, we don't even say about that, about Paul. Uh, two, at best, were martyrs. And that yeah, is- I, I would maybe add uh, James, the brother of Jesus, because I'm not convinced by the arguments that that's an interpolated passage, that that wasn't actually in Josephus originally. So on the hypothesis that it was in Josephus originally, that Josephus intended to say that this is James, brother of Jesus, called yeah. Christ, and this is actually referring to the Jesus that we are talking about, right. then I would say three. Okay. Yeah. But of those three, it, that doesn't put any um, stock in the idea that they died. Uh, they, would, they, were willing, they wouldn't die for something they would know as a lie or that they could have repented. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, if, if I was in the debate, like debating the resurrection, for example, I would have no problem just... Uh, just granting that for the sake of argument, because first of all, that only works against the idea that the apostles were lying intentionally, which I don't believe. Like, I don't think that Christianity started as a scam, basically. I think that if there were apostles who believed that Jesus appeared to them, they were just honestly mistaken. And I think there are very good hypotheses that can explain how that belief would arise if it was in fact mistaken. You don't need Jesus to be actually raised in order for the apostles to believe that Jesus was raised. Those those two things, I think, are not connected. 
And so that's that's the first thing. And the second thing, I was just I would just ask, uh, okay, let's let's grant for the sake of argument that these apostles really saw the risen Jesus. What is your source for what they saw? Where can I read what they saw? And the Christian would, of course, have to point to the appearances, narratives in the Gospels. But if you accept those as historically reliable, then you no longer have to argue for the resurrection, right? Right. So it's kind of circular. Like it, the argument, uh, the martyrdom argument only works if you presuppose that the appearances, narratives in the Gospels are reliable. Right. But if you accept that, you don't have to argue anything because you already believe the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I titled this "Stop Using the Martyrdom Apologetic." Um, without looking, name uh, who, name the brothers, the twelve disciples who were brothers. <laughs> of who? Of someone? Yeah, like there, there's brothers in the twelve. Which were the brothers? And the brothers? Yeah, who? John and James are the sons of Zebedee, uh, so they are brothers. Uh, name, James correct? the Just. Who? Mm, sorry. Correct. Yeah, James the Just, who is not among the twelve, is a uh, brother of Jesus. Simon the Zealot is maybe some Simon the brother of Jesus. At least he's conflating with, conflated with him in some accounts. Yes, that's right. And there is then there is James, son of Alphaeus, and I think someone else is also called son of Alphaeus. I think Matthew. Uh, right. Yes. Yep. So uh, did you say Matthew and who? Matthew and James, sons of Alphos. I yeah, think James they are the both younger. In yeah. yeah. And but there's another I guy think... who's uh, maybe a brother of James the Younger and Matthew. Uh, I don't know, but Thomas Didymus is obviously a twin brother of Jesus. Everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is Jude. They're identical. Jude. The, mm -hmm. s some say that Jude, James the Younger, and Matthew are all brothers. And, okay. and and you miss Peter and Andrew, that they're brothers. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's the obvious one. Okay. So yeah. that, that was a family business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. So I hope this uh, all this research comes into handy when you get your PhD and whatever. Yeah, sure. And I, I, I want to reiterate the reason why I decided to do that is because Captain Fartlicker in the comment section of your last video suggested that. It was the one before that, not the last one, with uh, Cam and T Jump. So if you have interesting topics that uh, you wanted us to look at, then let us know. I want everybody to know that uh, Fartlicker is not his real name. He's also known as um, Bartholomew or Nathaniel or Thaddeus or Labaius or. Judas. Oh, Jude and Judas. Like some people say Jude, his real name was Judas. Did you ever hear that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that was one of the most common names. It just means the Jew. So Jesus is literally betrayed by the Jews. By the Jew. Okay, so I'm going to start the music. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to... Poof. Poof. Well, that was fun. Um, so you said you... Spent five days on this? Six days, yeah. Six days. On and off. Wow. Yeah, I wanted to read some of the, well, all of the sources, of course, uh, anyway, so it's just uh, sooner than later, right? I had to postpone reading the Jewish Apocrypha, which is also fascinating, like the Apocalypse is first, second, third, Enoch stuff like that i think sean mcdowell did his phd in this or something well if, it, if that if that's true then it's that's terrible because that's in terrible. terms of yeah in terms of like methodology of history and just like valid inferences the book is atrocious and that you can read reviews there is probably nothing I could say about that. It hasn't already been said. Which book is worse, but Sean McDowell's or uh, Bauckham's? Uh, Bauckham's definitely, I'll, and I'll tell you why. If you read Josh McDowell, like you don't have to be smart in order to see immediately that what he's saying is like doesn't follow. But Bauckham has it's more difficult to see why he's wrong. 
topic. For example, a lot of people buy this research into frequency of names. So you need to know a little bit about statistics, for example, in order to see why that doesn't fall. Uh, yeah, that's my ranking okay. at the moment. Okay, well, my apologies to, um, to Jesus. He was scheduled to come on and join us today, <laughs> but we ran out of time. Thanks, guys, for hanging out on a Saturday Saturday afternoon if you live in the United States. And what time is it there in uh, Eastern Europe? It's exactly midnight. Oh, midnight. Okay, go to bed. Thanks, guys. See you next time.